Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gilbert, and on behalf of Roman Bookstore, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event. Uh, that is the LA Crime Writers Panel, featuring Steph Cha, Rachel Housel Hall, Joe Ide, Naomi Hirahara, and moderated by Desiree Zamorano. We are so excited to be celebrating Indies First and Small Business Saturday. So uh, we thank you everybody for supporting the stores that need the help the most right now. Um, now, Romans Live will continue to host virtual events for the foreseeable future, and you can learn more about them on our website as well as our social media. Now, our next event is Monday at 6 p.m. as we host Diana Peterson Moore, as she's in conversation with Julie Winkle Giuliani, discussing her book, Consequential Communication in Turbulent Times. For regular updates on upcoming Romans Live events, please feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. Now, today's virtual event will have a Q&A component. Uh, so to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the, the bottom of the screen over here. Um, and uh, if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the uh, Like arrow next to it. We'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Uh, also, if you'd like to purchase a copy of uh, any of our author's books from today, uh, you can click on the buy button, this little green button over there. That'll take you to the event page uh, for today. And uh, right at the bottom, uh, we have all the latest books from each author. Now, with that being said, it is time to get to the introductions. So there are a few. So let's start with our moderator. Uh, Desiree Zamorano is a playwright, Pushcart Prize nominee and novelist, author of The Amato Women. She's the director of the Community Literacy Center at Occidental College. She also collaborates with Inside Out Writers, a program that works with formerly incarcerated youth. Steph Cha is the author of Your House Will Pay, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and California Book Award, and the Juniper Song Crime Trilogy. She's a critic whose work has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, and the Los Angeles Review of Books where she served as noir editor and is the current series editor of the Best American Mystery and Suspense Anthology. Uh, Rachel Housel Hall is the author of the acclaimed Lou Norton series, the standalone thriller, They All Fall Down, and co-author of The Good Sister with Dan Patterson, which appeared in the New York Times bestselling anthology, The Family Lawyer. She's the senior development officer for the donor relations department at Cedar sinai she currently serves on the board of directors of the Mystery Writers of America, is a member of Sisters in Crime, and has participated as a mentor in the Association of Writers and Writing Programs, and Writing Programs, Writer to Writer Program. <laughs> Joe Ide uh, is of Japanese American descent and grew up in South Central Los Angeles. Joe's favorite books were the Conan, the author of Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes series. The idea that a person could face the world and vanquish his enemies with just his intelligence fascinated him. Joe went on to earn a graduate degree and had several careers before writing his debut novel, IQ, inspired by his early experiences and love of Sherlock. And finally, Naomi Hirahara is the Edgar winning author of the Masari mystery series, including Blood Haina, Sayonara Slam, and the seventh and final in the series, Hiroshima Boy. Her Masare books have earned such honors as the Chicago Tribune's 10 Best Mysteries and Thrillers and Publishers Weekly Best Book of the Year. She is also the author of the LA-based Ellie Rush mystery series and her most recent title, Iced in Paradise, a Leilani Santiago Hawaii mystery. She is also a Roman's Walk of Fame recipient. <laughs> So, if I'll say that. <laughs> so, after all of that, without further ado, let's welcome this amazing panel uh, and turn it over to our fantastic moderator, Desiree. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Woohoo! Thank you, Suits. Thank you, Gilbert. That was a fantastic <laughs> introduction. I think I'm getting a little feedback. What do I need to do? Um, let's see here. The only thing you have in the room. How was that? Well, if you have a pair of headphones, that will definitely cut out. And also to make sure that if you have any other windows open besides the Crowdcast window, close those out. That should also uh, benefit. Sometimes they'll, sometimes those windows will double up and uh, yeah. have some feedback. I think that's what it was. That's exactly yep. what it was. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. All you right. Got... Once again, thank you for that <laughs> fabulous introduction. Um, I'm so excited and I'm actually I'm pretty like, I was actually kind of nervous because this is quite the crowd. I mean, so much the accomplishments you heard, everything that everybody's done. Wow, I'm, I'm getting a little worked up over here. But before we do that, I really want to talk about 
you know, we have we have people who are big fans of crime fiction. I'm a huge fan of crime fiction. You are writers of crime fiction. I want to hear from all of you why this genre. It's always interesting to me why an author chooses the genre or how the genre chooses the author. And I'm actually, you're the only person muted, Joe, but I'm going to start with you because uh, I'd like to get to know you a little bit better. So why this genre? Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. Uh, um, one more time. The question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why this genre? How did you fall into crime fiction? Did it call you or did you hunt it down? Um, wow. It, I, I, I guess it called me. Um, I, was, I was a screenwriter for a while and it was so unsatisfying um, that I quit. Um, nobody in the industry noticed, but I quit. <laughs> um, and I, w I moped around for a long time. I mean, it was my identity being a screenwriter. And um, at a certain point, I realized that I, I had to pay the mortgage and my only marketable skill was writing. That was it. I, I didn't know how to do anything else that anyone would pay for. Um, I, I really, I'm, I'm only organized on the page. I can't do anything practical. Uh, it, <laughs> in fact, there's a saying that my brothers made up that goes... Uh, if your plane crashes in the Amazon and you need to survive, uh, Joe is the one that you should kill and eat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so that's it's a, a gruesome way to pull you into that genre. <laughs> it's a little harsh. It's a little harsh. <laughs> Thank you, um, Joe. I, I only had one idea. It was Sherlock Holmes in the hood. That was it. And I right. wanted to write that really badly. I don't know. I don't know if it was that one idea. That sounds like it's a series. Sounds like a sequel. Sounds like it could take you yeah. into the twenty second century. Thanks, Joe. Rachel, how did how did you how, tell us about your connection to this genre? Why? Um, one, you know, growing up in LA, you're kind of surrounded by it. And where I grew up, I was surrounded by you know the awful things that happened in the city. But then the families like mine who have this sort of normal life within it. And that's fascinating to me. Um, also, crime and mystery, you tend to, it can be anything you want. You know, you can have romance, you can have sci-fi, you can be noir, you can be cozy. So it's one of those kind of big tent genres that I am definitely, you know, that kind of writer that doesn't fall necessarily in either kind of little tent. So, but the power of the genre means that you don't have, be. You can kind of be anything you want. And now that um, we're recognizing that crime writers of color have incredible stories, you know, it, it, it's great that we get to tell stories that, you know, white audiences have told for a very long time, but now we get to do it from, you know, uh, uh, an old Japanese man who, you know, worked at Dodger Stadium or uh, a young Korean American girl who wants to be a detective in Koreatown. And, you know, it gets, we get to take these stories and make them ours and they're incredibly interesting. And I'm so excited that, you know, that, that there's so much to talk about. There's so many things to write about now for us. And that's wonderful, Rachel. And nobody, and you keep writing, you just keep writing those oh, books. Yeah. They keep coming up. That's fantastic. <laughs> Naomi, how about you? Why this genre? And I know you've also written other things, but I'm, so it's, I, I think I, I gravitate towards writing about ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. And I think that's why, you know, the high stakes of crime and murder, mystery, all of that kind of falls in line with that. And I'm also a, a former journalist. I was working for a, a, the daily Japanese American newspaper, first as a reporter, then editor. And I did that. I guess cumulatively around 10 years. And um, a Japanese scholar said I had like a journalistic style in my, in my mystery writing. And at first I was very insulted <laughs> because I was going, what does that mean? Oh, I'm just a bloody journalist. But then um, I've come to totally get it now. And, and I think 
actually a crowdcast session at Romans earlier with Michael Connolly. You know, he's a former LA Times reporter. And the things he was saying, I totally, you know, I, I got it. Like, we like to observe what's happening and, and in, you know, integrate it in our books. So if there's a pandemic happening, we're going to put it in our books. So I go, okay, this all makes sense. Yeah. So, and I think just be writing um, nonfiction on a deadline, you just organic. I think one of the hardest things to teach people is plot, you know, and what is the narrative engine. And when you're a journalist, you have, you're, you're doing that every single day. So it's kind of built in to our DNA. Great, wonderful name. I would also say your journalist background you know, gives you such a wonderful sense of deadlines and getting things done. Yeah. And, and it supports your prolif prolif prolificity, whatever that would is. Your, how much, how many words you get out there in books. Thank you so much, Naomi. Steph Cha, why this genre, which won you the all these prizes? Tell us. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that Joe's answer cracked me up because <laughs> getting into novels, novel writing, because you need to make money. <laughs> 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 oh, I wish that was more inspiring, but <laughs> and then it worked. It's crazy. Um, I was in law school when I started writing novels, so I got into novel writing because um, the thing that I'd done that was the safe route was less interesting to me than this thing that I was kind of always interested in and wanted to do for fun. Um, but I backdoored into crime fiction um, through Raymond Chandler, actually. And, you know, this is the right panel to talk about that because, um, you know, I read Chandler in college and I love Chandler. I still love Chandler. Um, but I, but I, as soon as I read The Big Sleep, one of my first thoughts was I would love to read a contemporary version of Raymond Chandler that looked a little bit more like my Los Angeles, like this kind of, you know, I have like a very diverse group of friends. My, I grew up in a Korean American community um, that is the largest ethnically Korean community outside of major cities in Korea. Um, and so I just had this idea that I wanted to read that. And, um, you know, a few years passed and nobody had written it and I wanted to write a novel. And so that's kind of what I went to. And I was—I thought of it as being kind of in conversation with Raymond Chandler, you know. And I read—I read a good deal of crime fiction, but not a lot, not like contemporary, not a lot of contemporary stuff. And I don't—I wouldn't say I was especially well versed in the genre, but I wanted to write this book that grappled with the hard-boiled tradition and Raymond Chandler specifically. And once I wrote that first book, you know, I think—I think initially too, I wasn't thinking that the Jennifer Song novel would be a series. I also wasn't necessarily thinking that I would keep writing crime fiction, um, but once I started writing those books, I realized how useful uh, crime fiction is as a tool for kind of exploring everything around me. You know, all these issues that I care about. You know, everything that that I, I think about all the time. You know, kind of larger social issues that affect people in, on like on the ground that are also these political issues. And I realized that crime fiction is the best way to explore these things because because as Naomi said it's about you know normal people in extreme sort of circumstances and you know we read those headlines every day and those there are real people behind all of them and so that's kind of how I, that's kind of where I landed that crime fiction is just so useful in that way it's so illuminating that um you know I it's I find it hard to leave the genre when you can do so much with it and and I want I I love that answer because being in LA, which is what the, the either the first or second biggest city in America, we have yeah. everyone here. We do everything here. We have every kind of weird weather pattern and every kind of biosphere is here. And so that means that our crime fiction, especially, gets to be as wide and diverse and weird and mm -hmm. tangential and all the rest of it because there's so much to do. I mean, every book that I've written, there's something about fire in them because yeah. every time I'm starting to write, there's a fire burning, yeah. you know, it, or, or the El Nino comes, you know, it, there's, there's so much, the city is so ripe with possibilities for crime fiction. I absolutely love writing LA. Yeah, so fire I love they become a season, right? 
Uh -huh. The it fire has become a season. Yeah. 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 Sorry about that. So I love the way that everything we do, right? You don't go out sometimes, your eyes burn, you know, you're irritated and that affects our characters' lives, right? So, yeah. So I love the way Steph, you brought up LA and Rachel, you jumped right on, a, on in that. And I'm going to start with Naomi with this question because I think you may have had the longest writing career as far as I know. Um, how has the genre changed yeah. throughout your career? I, well, just recently, it's kind of exploded in terms of um, writers of color, but you know, and it's 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 incredible. You know, I'm just enjoying reading all these books, and you know, and it's not only in Los Angeles, but all throughout you know the whole nation. When you're going to the rural South and you know, uh, it's just amazing, amazing. So I think that's a, a positive change. Um, yeah, I think people, they, they're kind of tired about the same old, same old, you know, either the, the very traditional police procedural, they want a, a new kind of twist to that whole thing. Um, or else, uh, yeah, even, I mean, we'll see what happens more. And Steph's probably better read than I am, but just like in terms of the serial killer, like what's, well, I guess with Ivy Pochota, that's a different kind. You're looking from the victim rather than the serial killer. So yeah, there's, there's, uh, I, there's a lot of excitement, I think, from this community of, of, of people who have in the past been on the margins. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, I think you and I have said, oh, yeah, they've got that one person on the list. They've got that one author on the yeah. list. How have you have you seen changes in that? I have, because like like Naomi, I mean, our 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 little like crime writers of color group has tremendous. It's, it's it's grown and it's good stuff. You know, it's not OK, we'll publish you, but we don't believe in this book mm -hmm. or what you're mm -hmm. saying. It's like really, really interesting characters and lifestyles. I'm glad because, you know, and I've said this before, who of us, especially in Los Angeles, likes going to the same restaurant over and over again? Like if you go to a food court and there's just an Auntie Anne's pretzels and a Jamba Juice, and that's all there was at the food court, you'd be bored. You like pretzels, you like Jamba Juice, but damn, do you want it every day, right? And so now we get to have all of it and it's all wonderful and we all learn things about each other you know I, as readers we read a lot because we're interested in seeing how other people live right and so if if you're not doing that with with you know reading outside you know a white detective then you're not being a good reader reader um so yeah, I, I'm glad that we get to tell our stories and I'm glad that readers are interested in reading stories that fall outside you know, the traditional uh, cop characters. Thank you, you know, especially Romans and everybody here. Thank you for giving all of us a chance to share that. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Steph or Cha, do you have something to add in terms of changes in the genre through your writing career? Yeah, I, I definitely okay. have thoughts on this because let's see I first I sold my first novel in 2011 and I think at the time you know and this is one of those things you can't prove it but I, I suspect that at the time my being a Korean American woman writing in noir was not particularly appealing uh, I think that if I had debuted like even three to five years later it might have been a different story there was more appetite for crime fiction told by women, thanks to Gillian Flynn. Uh, there, you know, I think there is a little, you know, there's a little bit more of an interest in um, in non-white writers, um, but in 2011, none of that. And uh, my first book came out in 2013, and that's when I started going to crime conventions and paying attention really to the like publishing world. Um, and I can tell, it, I mean, even just visibly, everything feels different. You know, I used to go to BatchaCon or Thriller Fest, and I would reliably be the only, you know, other than Naomi, the only Asian in the room. Uh, I would be um, usually the youngest person and one of a minority of women. Uh, and it was funny because I would be in panel after panel after panel where it was just like me and a bunch of people who didn't look like me. Um, and, you know, 
I don't think that crime fiction is suddenly like this, you know, diverse paradise or anything, but it, we've come a long way. Yeah. You know, I used to think that, I used to think that, um, you know, these crime novels I would read would be about like white men with a twist, you know? And I thought that my twist was just that I'm like a woman and I'm Korean, you know? And I feel like as more of us come in and start writing our stories, we become less defined too by just being like other. Um, and I think that's that that's a relief. That's a real relief, you know, not having to be like a representative or a stand-in for like, you know, every single non-white uh, <laughs> person who's like on your publisher's list or on a certain panel. You know, it's it's nice to be able to kind of take that as like a given that like, oh, it's, that's not the unusual thing about you and like get a little bit past that. And I think that we've only recently gotten to that point where I feel a little bit like that. I think yes. that's an indication, I think it's an indication of project, of progress in and of itself, that publishers are more willing to judge the books on the basis of the books and not necessarily who wrote them. You know, that, that good crime fiction is, is good crime fiction. And I, 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 think, I think their perspective has the publisher's perspective has changed in terms of, 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 of thinking more about the book itself as opposed to the author and the, the race of the author and whether the race of the author or that cultural perspective is going to affect sales. Mm -hmm. Is it a good book or isn't it? You know, I, I mean, I, my own expectations were that, that I was hoping upon hope that a little quirky publisher would give the new guy a break. <laughs> um, but but I was really happy to see that that publishers were, were willing to read the book and judge it on the basis of the book, and not that it took place in the hood or that the the um, the stories took place you know mostly within the hood with hood characters. Um, I was I was really heartened by that, and um, I'm heartened by it now. That's <laughs> great. Too bad there are only four oh. big publishers left, which means uh, you know I guess yeah. the good news is they're all going to have. <laughs> writers of color on their list because there are only going to be four of them. Right. Also, go ahead, Rachel, go ahead. Did you want to say something? Oh, no, that was Naomi. Okay. Oh, Naomi, I oh, I was just but saying that thinking, well, also it's a function of the readers too. I mean, it's publishing, but, mm -hmm. you know, I think always there, there's been like people of color, like publishing all along, maybe you know, under the radar is smaller presses, but it's also figuring out how do we reach our readers? You know, how do we, um, and I think maybe publishing, it's, uh, mystery publishers or publishers of mystery, they just had one certain reader in mind and just, this is our formula to reach this reader. And now they've, you know, there's younger readers that people, you know, come to books in a different way. So. I know for my career, I've had to kind of uh, run after my readers, you know, and I think working for a Japanese American newspaper, I, you know, I kind of knew what I had to do to get one, not that I just want those readers, but that forms one of my, you know, foundations. But I, yeah. I think, yeah. I, I also think that, that publishers, I mean, we are starting in a deficit because people figure, oh, she's black. She has nothing you know, in common with me and my experience as a white woman. It's like, well, you read books about vampires and werewolves and you see yourselves in that. You, you can see yourself in my experience, someone you know, who grew up probably doing many of the same things you did. I mean, I grew up reading Stephen King. I knew nothing about Banger, Maine, but I was scared of clowns in sewers with eyes like dimes. You know. I, I can make that jump and it's up to, you know, publishers can help bridge that divide for a writer like me and a, 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 an older white woman in, in Portland, Maine. So we do need them to kind of give us, you know, some boost in that because we are starting, I believe, in a deficit because a lot of readers don't see themselves in, in us. I think, I think that, that if I was going to fault publishers, they have a lot of faults, but they haven't tried to expand the audience. Yeah. You know, and I, I think what Naomi, Naomi is true. They have this bureaucratic machinery that knows how to market in a particular way towards the middle of the, um, 
of, of the readership, which is largely white and, and largely female. And they know how to do that. But in terms of expanding the audience that is trying to reach out to a more diverse readership, I think they've, they've failed. And um, I think they continue to fail. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So I, I want to, first of all, say, I agree, Rachel, we're starting from a deficit. And, you know, as, as Steffi was mentioning, you know, no person of color can represent everything and certainly not the decades of erasure, right? Decades of erasure. So here we are. But I'm, I share your enthusiasm. Things are changing, right? There have been some authors not sharing their actual ethnic identity to get in under the white radar to, to publish as white. And I think it, there's all, it's, a, it's almost a strength right now. So I do hope for good things. And I'm not going to mention some terrible novel. Um, <laughs> but, but, so, but I'm going to say, as writers of color, you know, we already have a way of seeing the non-dominant culture, right? We already have a way of looking at abuse of power, um, maybe p police abuse. I am really super wondering about how the movement of Black Lives Matter has or has not impacted what you're going to be addressing in the future or how you're going to be addressing things in the future. I'm really curious about how this social movement is impacting your writing. Well, for, for me, it's always been. Black lives have always mattered. <laughs> well, nothing really is changing for me except people are like nodding in agreement and saying, yes, Black lives matter. And, that, and because of that, this, 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 and this. Black folks have always said since the beginning of our time here that some cops are just downright dirty and we don't hero worship like that. So it's finally nice to, and, and, and that there's abuse and that, you know, things happen and black folks aren't being crazy and, and, and over sensitive about something. So it's nice that folks are finally catching up to what especially black women have said all this time. And so with that, you know, in many ways I have wind beneath my wings because people are finally like looking up and looking out and saying, hey, that that isn't right. And oh, you guys weren't being crazy about cops just stopping you for the hell of stopping you. So in that way, um, again, nothing's changed except now people are willing to say, ah, yeah, I get it. And that's a wonderful thing when you're looking for readership. Yeah, um, you know, in June, it, end of May, early June, when the George Floyd protests were happening across the country, I had a lot of people reaching out to me, um, kind of telling me that like my book, you know, they thought about me and my book. Um, and I and because my book deals pretty directly with the Black Lives Matter movement, it deals with protests in Los Angeles. Um, and you know, I, I saw like a I saw like a review somewhere because I read my I read my online reviews that <laughs> that asked like that wondered whether my publisher had made me go back and like insert references to like the Black Lives Matter movement because like I think this reader just wasn't necessarily aware that these things we do. Uh, and so, it, so a, a lot of the feedback I got like this year was that my book was very timely and prescient or whatever. You know, this is not to plug my own book. Sorry, I'm not trying to do that. But my point being that I like, started writing this book in 2014. You know, which which I, and I and Black Lives Matter existed before 2014, although it really blew up uh, after Michael Brown was murdered. And, you know, after the unrest in Ferguson, um, but I was writing this book then. You know, so it and so because I was working on this novel for like four and a half years, you know, I kind of and I and you know I started writing this novel because I was already interested in the movement. I was already interested in in the kind of in the social problems under uh, that caused that movement, um, but. I was paying attention, like very close attention to what was going on, everything pertaining to violence against black people and black bodies between 2014, you know, specifically within that window between 2014 and 2019, let's say. And it was interesting because like, there's just the cycle of violence is constant. The, the media cycle is not constant. And right. so people zoom in and out of these cases, right? 
But like, there isn't necessarily anything special about like the one case that blows up and becomes like a focal point. It's just, uh, it's kind of a combination of other factors. But while the media spotlight comes in and out, you know, the, the actual engine of police brutality and of oppression of minority groups, particularly black people, you know, that is constant. That's constantly in the background. And if you look at it, and it's the background for a lot of people, but if you look at it, or if you're involved in it, then, you know, it's not even a background thing. That's just kind of the rhythm of your everyday life. That's the rhythm of your community. And so, you know, I think this is like a very important thing for crime fiction to address. It's something that, you know, and I don't think all crime fiction has to address it. You know, I don't think there's like that duty for all crime writers of color either. But it's something that I've been very interested in. And I think it's kind of one of the more pressing frontiers of, of like present day America. And I think that, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm interested in crime fiction that explores that. You know what, Steph, I'm just going to interrupt here. It's, I'm certainly not uh, suggesting that everybody has to address that or nor, nor that every person of color has to address that. Um, but you do bring up uh, what I would translate as anti-blackness and anti-blackness is pervasive. And I think just because we are a writer of color doesn't mean we are free of it. Oh, you know? And I think all, all writers, all of us need to interrogate ourselves regarding anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. Joe or Naomi, did you want to add anything to these thoughts? Mm -hmm. I'll go after Joe. Um, I think it's hard to write about LA without writing about uh, racism and police brutality, even within the conventions of the story. Even if you're not trying to write about it, right. you're trying to tell a good story, you are gonna encounter it um, uh, in some way, just because your story's in LA. I, 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 um, I, I don't write about, I, I don't do social commentary consciously, but it's there. I mean, if you're writing an organic story, it's really hard to get around it. You know, um, it, I, I think it's 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 a good thing in the, in the sense that what you've been saying is that there's everything here. Yeah. All the issues are here. All the material that a novelist needs is right here, including including the social issues of the day. I think for me this summer, well, actually spring, even before the George Floyd murder, um, I had been in a book club on Zoom. I've been doing a deep dive on mass incarceration mm. and um, kind of in faith-based groups. And one of the books we read was Rethinking Incarceration. And um, this book was interesting because it also meant uh, mentioned the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. And I had never really made that connection of, you know, that kind of incarceration confinement with what's happening to mostly brown and black, you know, people today. But then it's like, oh yeah, because if you, be, if pe the government confines a group of people, detains them, you're thinking there's a reason, there's a legitimate reason why it's happening. You know, so it so and I took I did another kind of deep dive class. So that's been um, personally eye opening for me. And I think for the book that's coming out next year, Clark and Division, I'm going to plug my book, <laughs> which is set in Chicago, um, which deals with an L.A. family that goes to Manzanar and is released to Chicago, which is the number one location that people were released. I mean, they were released into that um, city. And just thinking, I, I think it was a couple things. It was just being confined in our homes during the pandemic. And then I'm thinking, what's gonna happen when we're actually out and about? You know, we're gonna, we, we have trauma, right? Yeah. It's gonna be kind of strange. And, um, but I, just thinking about these people who were confined in a desert, you know, or swamp. And then they're suddenly in the big city freely, you know, it's even though it, it hasn't really been documented, just being a human, that's got to do stuff to your mind. So those are kind of the things I've been thinking about in, you know, during the pandemic. Thank you, Naomi. And you have me now thinking about uh, the incarcerated in Adelanto, right? The incarcerated yeah. undocumented. Yeah. So making that connection. Before I go on, um, listeners, feel free to tap in a question and ask a question. And since people are plugging their books, there's a little green bar there that says, buy their latest books. Just, just giving a shout out to Romans. Um, so I love this little deep, deep discussion here. 
I'm going to mix it up just a little bit. Naomi talked about the pandemic. I mean, we cannot ignore the pandemic. So, no. so people talk to us. I mean, I, I really want to hear what have you struggled with? And, you know, any, and then we'll move to anything positive that came out of this. What have you been struggling with? Steph, can you, has this, how has this hit you, this pandemic? Um, honestly, I feel like one of the luckiest people of 2020 because I had a baby three weeks into lockdown. So like I had three weeks to be like pretty bored and scared. And then I just had a baby. <laughs> 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 he came a little bit early. And so, you know, I feel like honestly I've benefited on balance because my husband is working from home until like, you know, for like the first whole like first year of like our kid's life, my husband is working from home and you know, I like moved, we moved in with my parents for the first few months and we still see them. We're in like the same circuit. Um, and so I feel like, you know, we'd be new parents anyway. So like, what are we really missing out on? I guess like the ability. To <laughs> that is true. Like, there is stuff, but like, you know, stuff that like everybody is dealing with. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I have felt very, very lucky because I'm, you know, spending all this time with my new baby um, and, uh, you know, I even, but, but the one thing though, is that I have not been able to write and, um, I'm hoping that that will change. I wrote one short story in June, um, just because I was commissioned to write one and, uh, that was really difficult. Like it was really hard to write a short story. It took a whole month to do it. And it, I was just kind of feeling time, you know, and whenever my mom had the kid and I would be able to do that, but you know, it was like, it was hard. And uh, only recently I've been able to hire childcare by which I mean my brother's girlfriend who is already in our circle, in our bubble. Um, and so I'm, I finally, I, I, as, as, of a, as of the election, because she was doing election related work, um, I am able to start writing again. Um, and I haven't yet um, because I'm reading for Best American now, but, uh, uh, and I had a couple other assignments to do, but like, I, I hope to get started on something new in 2021, but you know, something, something that like bothers me a little bit that, you know, it, it, that stops me is that, you know, I write about contemporary Los Angeles. I write about kind of the world outside my house and I am not seeing that world right now. Not only am I not seeing it, but I don't know what it's going to look like after we get out. Um, you know, there were like, this, this pandemic is exacerbating so many issues that already existed. You know, oh, you know how, like um, housing shortage in LA has been like a massive problem for years. You know, homelessness has been a really harsh issue that we have not figured out a way to deal with, and the and coronavirus has exacerbated that. And so I'm curious what the world, what Los Angeles looks like after this. You know, there's a part of me that hopes that like things are so bad that like we have to do something. But there's also a part of me that wonders if we're going to come out of this and find a world that's even more desperate. And depending on what that looks like, you know, my novel will probably look different. Yeah. When when we started lockdown, I said I don't want to leave lockdown coming out to see that Google has bought everything outside. <laughs> you know, I, um, Joe, what? Tried. Yeah, Google and Amazon will own everything. All the independent stores, everything gone. Um, but but Steph, you're a new mom, so there's multiple issues going on, whether you're writing or not writing. I mean, that's that's a lot of your creative energy taking care of new life. Joe, um, I'm going to end with Naomi because she has things thoughts on the pandemic. But Joe, how are you starting with? How are you? What's what are you, what struggles? Or you were saying you're like this is like normal life, sitting alone and writing. Well, I'm you know. I spend too much time alone in the first place, but the pandemic has given me more reason to just stay the hell inside the house. Um, I think I, I, I think the pandemic has, has has sharpened the lines of the issues. Yeah. Um, you know, we're all home and we're all watching TV, and so and so the uh, the killings, the police killings, may have gotten may have may have gone by the wayside. We're not all of America at home seeing these things live. And um, I, 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 it, the pandemic itself is tragic, but it has it has sharpened the lines. It has brought focus to issues that might have gone um, might have gone under the bridge and gone away. Uh, it's 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 hard to think pan, you know positive about the pandemic, but it, oh, it, it may have been that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Rachel, what have you been struggling with? Anything good coming out of it? Um, I'm, I'm very busy, <laughs> uh, but I'm also very busy. I have a 16 year old and um, it, it's been hard for her initially. Uh, her last social event before everything shut down was um, the funeral for one of her best guy friends mm -hmm. who committed suicide. Oh, oh. And the funeral was the last big event for all her, her friends. And then the next, you know, the next week, everything shut down. So helping her get through the loss of her friend, but also the loss of her support system. And then the pandemic. And then the George Floyd killings. And then the protests, you know, it just one difficult conversation after the other, after the other, after the other, as she's 16. And we all remember 16. This was supposed to be her hot girl summer. You know, we, we grew up in LA and you know what it's like to be, you know, cute and you got a little money and you're supposed to be out. And here she is crying because of so much loss. So getting through that, um, my day job, you know, I, I write for Theater Sinai and March 13th, I was at, you know, Left Coast Crime with Naomi, you know, and I drove that Friday when Left Coast Crime shut down. I drove from San Diego and went straight to Beverly Hills to, to Cedars because I knew that it was about to start for us. Crisis communications and fundraising and all the stuff to let the world at LA know, this is bad, you need to stay home, we need money, all this stuff. And so day job, it had been relentless. I worked weekends and wrote weekends, all this stuff for my day job and I was exhausted, I burned out and there was not a lot of room for my writing, but I still did it and I sold two books and a whole bunch of other projects. And I've been productive balancing those two things, the day job and writing. But I did notice that it was harder for me to get going in the morning. I get up early to write. I get up at five o'clock now. And it took me some time to warm up because I realized my commute around Los Angeles, that was my warming up. As I'm driving, I'm thinking about what I'm about to write. And by the time I sit down, I'm ready to go. But seeing that there was no more commute, I didn't have that kind of warm up time. So that has been difficult for me. Um, I we finally I have a true workspace now in our office. We've had it before, but it wasn't a really good office. You just kind of my daughter would go in there to play Sims on her computer. But now I actually behind me have like a true standing desk and file cabinets and all that space so that I can separate my work life from my home life because I was at the dining room table and my work life was brought out all on my dining room table. So I could never relax. So now I have my own space, a dedicated space to have that kind of um, separation. So it's been, I would say 2020 professionally has probably been the best year of my professional life. Um, and it's strange because I'm getting to reach out to more readers through events like this. Um, I'm getting to know more people. Uh, I My writing muscle is stronger than before because I'm having to balance very important things with very important my novel things. So, yeah. Well, Rachel, you if, if anybody could be rock in 2020, you are doing it. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. Okay, Naomi. Struggles and successes in during pandemia. Well, um, in terms of writing, and I, I was not, I don't have this load of responsibility that, um, you know, Steph and Rachel have. I just have this very old Jack Russell, and a husband who's like helping like four hundred high school seniors. And man, when I see him at work at his computer, I'm going, that man is doing really good work, but important yeah. work. <laughs> and I see the struggle of, of high school kids. There's a lot of kids in LA Unified who are not who are going to graduate. They are not going to their classes. And who could blame them? You're going to do eight Zoom classes uh, in one day? I don't think so. Yeah. But um, 
uh, and just for me, my productivity, um, and I'm a pretty optimistic person, but it I knew that I could not be as productive as usual. I had a book due, I think it was in July, but then it got pushed um, back. So, you know, I eventually, gosh, when did I, I think the, so I had to write, I had to write during the pandemic. One thing that happened, that helped was I did, Desiree and I, we used to um, write with two other people at a little um, library, Hill Avenue Library in Pasadena. And I had to, I never had this problem before. I'm a former journalist, but I had to do sprints with other people to kind of get my head, you know, right. So, and just get back into writing. And so that's been helpful. Um, it was helpful that with this book that I got to spend more time doing a deep dive. I think if I was in the regular, you know, we're always, we have to do all this promotional stuff. We have to go to all these, you know, mystery conventions, you know, spending our own money, right? And now we're kind of saving some money by not going to some of these <laughs> places and maybe not tiring ourselves out. So I got to really focus on that book, which was good. So um, with Prospect Park Book, my local publisher, and I know Colleen Dunn Bates is here. Um, so I had started a more of a fun kind of cozy slash traditional novel set in Hawaii. And the second one, um, it was supposed to come out like next year, but then I, I told Colleen, let's do it 2022. And it's set in Kauai. And I was going, you know, some of these other traditional uh, mystery writers were saying, I'm not gonna write about the pandemic. No one wants to read about the pandemic, which could be true. I, you know, and I could be one of them too, but I'm going, if I'm writing it. about Hawaii, Kauai, they they recently said they're still gonna quarantine people, you know, uh, visitors, you know, uh, people who come into um, that island, opposed to Oahu and the big island, they're really being strict. It's like. How can I not write about the pandemic? But I'm setting it in October, 2020, and I'm writing it in past tense. The first book was present. So I think writing it in past gives me a little bit of distance, you know? But here's, it's the journalistic part of me. It's like, I kind of have to write about it. And in a weird sense, it's kind of fun. I, I hate to say that, but because there's all these limitations, you know, people can't hear each other with the mask. And there's like just this whole thing about tourism. I mean, Steph was saying these problems, there's social problems where places like Hawaii that have a lot of tourism, they're, they're, they're having like hundreds of thousands of people come onto their very delicate islands, you know, and the, the residents there, the native Hawaiians are going, we don't want, we want a different kind of tourism. So this is a chance for me to kind of explore that by being in California. So I'm not, and they're probably happy I'm not going over there doing research. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I, I love Naomi. Go ahead, Rachel. Go I ahead. add something about the pandemic. Um, you know, as crime writers, we, we, we write crime. And unfortunately, a lot of that is happening in people's homes during because they're locked up with each other and folks are angry, folks are unemployed, children are scared. I mean, it's a locked room mystery in every house right now. And for us not to write, to acknowledge that, I mean, like we just said you know, earlier, you as a crime writer, you're not, you don't have to, but to not acknowledge it. I mean, we write about what goes on in people's lives that's what we do and this is happening in people's lives right now you know some tragically so yeah i, I love that perspective rachel i also want to say naomi i love that you're writing it in past tense <laughs> so at some point at some point this will be in the past you're right. i can only handle this one day at a time yeah. so oh I, I, want, I want to ask you a final question here um all of you represent so many different parts of crime fiction and so many different voices. What What's ahead? Something exciting, something good. What are you looking forward to? What's What's ahead for you all? What's going on? Writing-wise or otherwise, whatever, whatever you want to share with us. 
Well, my next book is coming out in August, and it's the first time that I'm writing from a very a young woman's perspective. I used to be a young woman. Um, so she's she's 25, and um, it's the first time it's not a cop or a detective. And I'm excited that it's um, it's about. It's, Basically, she's a, a digital writer who's tasked with creating these kind of curating memories for people. And it's uh, she's curating the memories of a curio store owner. And there's something weird about these curios, these mementos, and this huh. owner. And so I, during the pandemic- Are we intrigued already? We're intrigued already, right? And my, our friend, Jess Lowry, did this really cool promotional kit where for her book, Bloodline, she sent these kind of cool, um, little steamer charts with things related to her book. And so I'm like, oh, I want to do that. And so I've been going to these thrift stores around LA looking for materials from curio store owners for a promotional package for that. So I've been like trinket crap shopping for the last, <laughs> the last month. So that's, that's, how, that's great. Yeah, my that's husband's great. like, is this our life now? I'm like, no, well, maybe. What's that thing sounds, sounds like fun. Yeah. What, what, are you, what are the rest of you looking forward to? What's exciting? What's up ahead? Well, I Give us all to, something to look forward to. Go ahead, Sam. I want to add, it's funny because I've made, I've done this so many times, but Rachel did not send an, an updated bio for this event. <laughs> so therefore you all didn't hear about her newest book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> <my dad. laughs> um, uh, so I'm looking forward to, um, Oh, Joita has a new book coming out that I'm excited about because I've read every book in the IP series. Um, I'm look, you know, since I don't have a book coming out, I am looking forward to the Best American Anthology. So um, I, I am the new series editor for this anthology that's existed for decades, and um, and the first one under my edit under my regime, let's just call it. Thank you. Regime change, regime change, sorry stuff. No, and I'm working on it now. Um, and it's been interesting because like, you know, the old editor, um, you know, did it for decades. And um, I think I was, one of the reasons they tapped me to do it is because um, the old editor and I had like a clash over like, whether the <laughs> five were drugs pretty much. <laughs> and, um, so, but basically HMH wanted to take the, take the best American series in like a new direction. And you know, it's interesting because they didn't give me like a mandate. They didn't sit me down and say, Hey, Steph, we want you to, you know, make this anthology appeal to a younger audience or a more diverse audience or anything like that. Like they didn't tell me that, but I kind of understand that that's my mandate. But the reason that that works is that that's just like my taste. And so, it, so you know, it's been really fun for me, you know, when I've been editing for LA Review of Books, um, just having this little department where I can impose my own taste on people. Uh, and <laughs> so I, I feel very lucky to be able to do this with Best American. And I've been reading some fantastic short stories. And I think we have a really strong collection coming out. Um, I don't know if it's been announced, uh, but Alifair Burke is going to be my first guest editor. And uh, we're all mm -hmm. swapping stories and talking about it. And I think uh, there's going to be some good stuff to read. Woohoo! That that is super yeah. exciting. Thank when you. When is Steph. it coming out, yeah. Steph? I should know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> coming out next year. I have to send things in, but I don't actually know when it's coming out. Right. Okay. Thanks. Steph. Thank Check it out next year. Joe, looking forward to things. We already hit. We already. Uh, somebody in the chat says a new book's coming out, or Steph says new book's coming out. I got a new book coming out in February. It's uh, another in the IQ series. It's called Smoke. Um, I've read all of Steph's books too. Um, we're we're an interesting contrast just between us. Um, I think I've told you this before, Steph. But Steph writes what a friend of mine calls necessary books. <laughs> uh, you need to read Steph's books. <laughs> Minor <are> fun. <laughs> Minor fun. But it's um, anyway. I'm I'm. I'm a longtime fan now of all of you. And it's it's a pleasure to Thank be you. here. A pleasure to talk to you. So you're saying your books are necessary fun. Is that what I hear, Joe? No, it's just fun. That's, what, that's how it translated to me. That's <laughs> my extremely fun. 
<laughs> fun and fun honestly, necessary. I, 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 I kind of like funny. to read three fun books for every necessary book, <laughs> at least. I, I know in pandemia, I need fun, all the fun books I can handle right now, okay? <laughs> Including, you know, serious, fun movies as well. Naomi, did I, I'm sorry if I lost track. Did you share what you're looking ahead to? Um, no, well, I'm really excited about Clark and Division. So it's coming out with Soho Crime in um, August, August too, same um, month of next year. And wow. it's my first historical, I, I think I'm kind of in my old age, I'm, I'm segueing into historicals. So I'll be doing um, a lot of those in the future. And um, it was a lot of hard work. It was because you have to have readers that, you know, look over, ge you know, I'm writing about a city I don't live in, the geography, and then you're looking at the history and just all this kind of, you're balancing all these kind of things. But when I kind of look at the, the nonfiction I've written, and I've always liked the young protagonist. I do, I love the 20, I don't something year old. I have no idea why. But but now it's a young because person. That's the age of your soul, Naomi, and that's the it, voice that you have. It is. It is. But okay. I have an old man's voice too. But then, but the fact that it's set in the forties, so it kind mm. of you know all it all kind of intersects. So yeah, I'm that's really great. That's that. great. Wonderful things to look forward to. Thank you all for sharing your good things. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that popped up in the question mark, and this is for you, Miss Cha. Um, Kyun Young can't get the character Grace in your house will pay out of his out of their head. Will you write a sequel? Oh, I'm not gonna write a sequel. That book, I think, from the beginning was supposed to be a one-off. In part because I think, like you know, I leave I leave things kind of unresolved at the end of the book, and the reason I leave them unresolved is that. Uh, can't solve anti-blackness and systemic racism in 300 pages, and you can't do this in 300 pages either. Uh, so no. I think, uh, oh, sure um, can. The, <laughs> those characters, you know, I imagine them living their lives, but not in a way that would be necessarily narratively interesting. Um, I, I think that they're they're going their ways, and uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of bad things that happen to everybody going, you know, after the end of the novel, and there will be good things too, and. Um, you know, I think uh, I think I've done enough to them personally, and uh, yeah. So I don't I don't think there can really be a sequel to that book. Okay, thanks, Steph. Um, for Rachel and Steph, a question: Are you two now concentrating on standalones? I like standalones because um, you just get to kind of start anew and start with this random person that you have no idea what their history is. And so they don't have to act a certain way. I love Lou Norton. I, I absolutely adore her. Um, but I, I like the freedom of, I have so many ideas in my head. And again, in LA, you meet so many different types of people that you want to give characteristics and names to that, you know, I, I, I'm excited about new ideas. So I like standalones now. I think for now I'm gonna stick with standalones, but you know, I don't even know what my next book is, so that could change. I've always thought that if I had another book where, um, where, uh, oh, that question's from Aline. Um, if I had another book idea that would be best told as a PI novel, I could resurrect Juno Busan, you know? I think, that, and I think like one of the reasons that Your House Will Pay wasn't a PI novel was when I came up with the concept, I was like, this just doesn't work that way. Um, but I do like the freedom of standalones. I mean, I think even from like a readership perspective, there's something to be said about being able to access a new audience without without having, you know, without them having to have like stuck with you from the beginning. Um, and, you know, I had a serious character and I, I, I really liked Juno Prasong, Um, but I also felt like I was beating up on her and it was just, it just felt like, you know, I could start a new story and then you like any you book somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> and I also felt like I just learned a lot by writing Your House Will Pay. You know, I think I learned more than I did writing the second and third books in the Juniper Song series. Um, because I just had to I don't know, I had to kind of expand my toolbox. And I, I, I like that experience. It's kinda of like going to school, you know, which I don't do anymore. So Hey, thanks, thanks. I get asked, I get asked if I'll get, ever get tired of writing the same characters. 
Uh, I don't think so, at least in the foreseeable future. Um, because in whatever small way, a good novel is supposed to illuminate human nature. But human nature is vast and complicated and for the most part inexplicable. So they may be the same characters, but you know, like all of us, they have stories that are just too deep to be told. And if I'm gonna actually be honest, I, 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 the, the, the Norton st stories didn't sell as well as they sh could have or should have to keep going. So a mm -hmm. lot of the determination of whether a series is going is totally out of the, uh, the writer's hands. And it's, you know, the readers mm -hmm. who help determine if a, if a series is going to come back. And so, yeah, I, I, now that I know that it's hard to get people to read number three, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start this new story over here because it hurts. Yeah, that Honestly, was a consideration for me too. You know, I felt like, I felt like I had, I, I had kind of tapered off. You know, I think like if you write a series and like people are like clamoring for more, which I think for the IQ books, like you know, I'm yeah. waiting for the next one. I think uh, if you don't have that, it's just like you start wondering, like, oh, what else could I be doing? Um, Naomi j like wrapped the Moss series recently and you know now you're writing another one but you're also writing standalones like what's your view on this you know what i i might i i'm looking forward to do doing more standalones historical standalones mm -hmm. and i i want to experiment more with voice kind of like you know steph like with your um your house will pay you know you got into the heads of different people and that you know well two main very dissimilar different. characters mm -hmm. And um, I want to do that is a hard. I've always wanted to do that during the my whole writing career, and I failed in doing drafts. Actually, the um, some of the big bachi was told in two people's point of view. That's a hard thing to nail. So I want to do that in the future. You know, with Clark and Division, I thought it was a standalone, but I might write a sequel. You know, but um, the family will be coming to Los Angeles, so I could start. Hmm. You know. Exploring LA again. <laughs> Yay. So I have another question for all of you. Um, what books are you looking forward to reading next? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, kind of an indiscriminate uh, a reader. Uh, I, I read a lot of my friends, or I buy a lot of my friends' books so that I can read them. Um, and I just kind of grab them. So any 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 chance that I get to sit down and read anything, I'm thrilled for it, and I don't fall asleep. That's the other thing. As you get older, and and craft, as a parent, you probably know this now. When you're still for too long, you kind of go into the sleep saver mode, and you just kind of <laughs> off. It happened to me last night. I'm trying to read a, a story, and I'm asleep, just like that. <laughs> I'm looking forward to finishing the book I'm reading now. Um, I, I usually don't talk, uh, think too far ahead, but it's it's Gabriel Talent's My Absolute Darling. Oh. Hmm. And it's one of the scariest damn books I ever read. Um, okay. It's really dark, but it's just excellent. Excellent. And yeah, I'm looking forward to finishing it. Great, wonderful. Well, I, I think M Megan Abbott and uh, Laura Lipman both have books that are coming out next year. Mm -hmm. And then Laura Rader Day has a historical mm -hmm. set during World War II um, that I think takes place where it, it, it's connected to Agatha Christie's and these children. But anyway, it sounds, you know, I, I'm really into reading historicals right now. So I'm looking forward to that book. I'm looking forward to all your, all your books. Um, and uh, you know what I just finished reading today? Uh, Crashed, Tim Hallinan's first Junior Bender book. Oh. It was so much fun. And I'll probably go read the rest of that series. I'd, re I'd read two of the later ones out of order. I thought it's just, it's so good. And I feel like this crowd will enjoy them because they're books about LA and they're fun. Mm -hmm. They're very good for like this kind of pandemic. You know, but I, actually I was, reading, I was reading this book and I thought of Joe's book. Uh, and um, what else? Um, I'm also looking for, oh, I'm reading, I'm also reading um, Joan Didion, The Year of Magical Thinking, which 
What a oh. terrible book to pick up as a new parent. Why did I do that? Why are you doing that? Terrible, terrible idea. You, know you do not I, need I, to finish that book. You do not need. I have to. I have to finish it. It's good. It's good. But you know what made me realize? It made me realize that way. Like, like, I am no longer going to be safe until, like, I'm on my deathbed and, like, my kid is still there, alive. <laughs> there's, there's no rest. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Steph. Welcome to motherhood. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. There's so it many thrillers, end. though, right? There's so many thrillers with the kid that's, you know, abducted. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. Steph, and I'm wondering yeah. if I'm going to appreciate those more or less now. Yeah. True, true. That, yeah. yeah. And then I have a final question here saying, how is this how are you fulfilling your purpose through your novels, through your writing? How do you feel you're fulfilling your purpose? For me, I'm, I'm telling the truth that I know with people who are around me and who look like me and who don't look like me, but have something um, to say. Um, I'm getting up every day and I'm writing and my daughter sees that she can be a day jobber and someone's wife and someone's mom, but she can still have that part of herself that is her and writing is me and it's mine. And I may be exhausted because of it, but I can say, I, I'm, I'm gonna go out of this world boxing and, and claiming something that I love. So that's my purpose. Anybody else wanna tackle that high level question? I guess I just want to like say something that means something to somebody before I go, you know, <laughs> and I feel like that's what I'm trying to do, you know, whether that be through, you know, writing things in my own voice or writing stories that I feel strongly about, um, you know, using narrative to grapple with my personal feelings about responsibility or what it means to be a good citizen or a, you know, a good friend or a good daughter, all those things are, you know, I, I guess my books are very personal because they always include uh, whatever is really on my mind and like chewing on me. Um, and so, you know, I guess like that and I write some Yelp reviews and that's like my contribution. <laughs> I love your Yelp reviews. Are you able to go out to restaurants to review those stuff? Just, just a recipe. Oh, now? No. Of course. No. I am reviewing. I, I have, I actually didn't Yelp for like six months, but I've started Yelping some delivery places now. <laughs> um, I think like, all, I think like all of us, we're, I'm, I'm obsessed. I mean, you, you wake up in the morning and it's just assumed you're going to write. You know, it's like, like not even a decision to write. You just, Do you it. go write. And I think, there is a, there's a, it's like a search. You wake up in the morning and you start writing, but you're not necessarily sure what you're searching for, mm. except something true. You want to write something true, even if it's in the context of a thriller or a mystery. Um, you're looking for that. At least I am. Well, we all are, but it, it, you're hardly ever satisfied. <laughs> You hardly ever actually write something true, um, but I think I, I think it is is something that 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 drives all of us. I think there's a lot of autobiography in my work, you know, through mysteries. So it's kind of interesting how bits of yourself are in all these, you know, very bizarre, extraordinary, you know, circumstances. I think an added thing for me is just being a, his, a social historian and uh, my work at the newspaper and just interviewing these individuals of a certain time and place um, who you know, were incarcerated and are dead. Most of them have passed away now, but I knew them. They were my friends, you know, and, and their stories are now saved in oral histories that all people, you know, younger people, better writers than I can will access them and have their own take. But I actually knew these people. So I feel like I can, you know, uh, one part of it's my role to capture these people I knew and put them on the page. And um, yeah, so I'm kind of like, I don't know, in between, in between person. <laughs> my goodness, Naomi, but what a beautiful response. In fact, what a beautiful response from all of you. So thank you so much. And I see Gilbert, I was wondering if I had a holler. Yay! There you are. Oh, oh man. 
Okay, and that's cool. I have been I've been here the whole time. Um, and but were my, your eyes open? <laughs> <laughs> this uh, it absolutely was. I, I can't say that all the time, but this absolutely <laughs> was uh, was amazing. Uh, it was such a fantastic panel. I just I mean I'm so happy that all of you could be here today because this is something that is just just I'm I'm over the moon about it because I was engaged the whole time and I could keep hearing you talking for who knows how long, much longer than you would want to be around here because you have other things to do. Um, so uh, thank you so much uh, for being a part of this. Um, just so everybody knows, you can make sure to click on that button down there that says buy the latest from each author. Um, and uh, you'll at the bottom of that page be able to see uh, all the books on the Romans website that are the latest from each. So you'll have uh, Your House Will Pay, uh, and Now She's Gone, High Five, Iced in Paradise, and The Amato Women are all there in one easy spot to find. Uh, so you can go ahead and get that and get your fill for now while uh, having to wait for a couple of new ones coming out next year. So that's fantastic. Um, so once again, Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this. Desiree, thank you so much for moderating. It was fantastic. My pleasure. Um, for all thank you. Thanks, Romans. 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 Thank you. Romans. So, yeah, you <laughs> please continue to support Romans and other small businesses. Um, we are currently open at, at, at the moment open for business um, for uh, limited in-store shopping with strict health guidelines in place. So you can stop by um, if you feel safe enough to do that, or you can always order online. We do ask for your patience uh, as we have been been um, wonderfully overwhelmed, <laughs> I'll, I'll adverb overwhelmed with wonderfully, wonderfully overwhelmed um, with the support that we've gotten from our community. Uh, so uh, th there was um, a bit of a, a weight on that, but you can always stop by as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, gift cards are always a good option too. So, <laughs> uh, but please make sure to purchase the books of all these fantastic authors. And um, I will eventually uh, run out of superlatives to thank all of you for this. But uh, as of right now, I, I'm not. So uh, so once again, thank you so much. You're all amazing. Um, and uh, I guess have a wonderful night. Okay. Good thank night, you. all. Thank yeah. you. Bye, everybody. Good to see everyone's face. Oh, okay. Yay. Thank you there, everybody. <laughs> yes, stay safe, all. Yeah. Give Leo a kiss for me. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> yeah, I want to hug him. All I right. want to do this to his cheeks. <laughs> bye. Bye. All right, bye.